Hello, everyone from just outside Boston in the United States. It's exciting to be here with all of you today virtually. And I actually wanted to start by asking the students a rhetorical question who have joined us today. I want you all to think about the unique skills and talents. What are the things that you're particularly good at? What are you passionate about? Think about the things that make you you. And because taking time to reflect on these questions is an important step in identifying a potential career path that will not only bring you security, but also fulfillment. So today, uh, we've all come together to expose you to a set of potential career paths that you might find are particularly well suited for your talents and are a great fit for your passions. Today, you will hear from professors and students across six different disciplines who are all experts and are especially well equipped to discuss career opportunities in their respective fields. Each presenter will speak briefly for about 10 minutes, and then we will end with closing remarks from Dr. Martina Jordan, Head of Community Engagement Research at the University of Pretoria. I want to end these opening remarks by stating that every one of you brings unique talents and skills that you can contribute to the world, and we're looking forward to helping you, helping guide you in your career exploration. So I will hand it over to you, Martina. Thank you very much. We are looking forward to this. So the first speakers will be Inge and her classmate that's standing in for Dr. Helga Lister from Occupational Therapy. Inge, can you project your screen or you're just talking? Oh, we have a PowerPoint that we will share. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. So thank you for listening today for our presentation. Um, we are final year occupational therapy students at the of the of Pretoria and um, our supervisor asked us to please take her place. <laughs> She's unfortunately ill, so we are here um, to present. Can everyone see our screen? Yes, we can. Sorry, I think it's a problem with the computer freezing. We just wanna go back. I think we're going to present like this. Hello everyone, so like you have know, heard, we are four year occupational therapy students from the University of Pretoria. Um, I'm Shanae and my colleague is Inga, and this um, presentation will just guide you through what occupational therapy is, what we do, and the different disciplines that you can go through, and also how you can apply for occupational therapy at the University of Pretoria. So first of all, what is occupational therapy? So occupational therapy is a therapeutic use of everyday life activities that we as occupational therapists call occupations with individuals or groups for the purpose of enhancing or enabling of participation in the roles, habits, routines, in the home, school, the workplace, community and other settings. Occupations are central to a service to the server users' um, identity and sense of competence, and they have meaning and value that they add to your life. Um, when a person engages in purposeful activities out of personal choice and they are valued, these classes of purposeful activities form part of your occupations. Thus, occupations are unique to each individual and provide personal satisfaction and fulfillment as a result of engaging in them. And you will hear sometimes we use the word service user instead of saying a patient or a client as we try to be person-centered during our therapy. So a service user can be a person, a group, or a population, depending on the specific aspect of occupational therapy. Then the occupations that we refer to, so the different activities that you do, can be um, we identify 
uh, even as activities of daily living, it's the activities that you do in your daily life, such as dressing, eating, and cleaning. Then you also have instrumental activities of daily living. Um, you also do these, but maybe not every single day. So it's like meal preparation, clean up and clean up and home care. Then you also have your rest and sleep, education, work, play, leisure and social participation. And then uh, occupational therapy quotes that we OT practitioners use is we would rather ask you what's, um, what matters to you and not what's the matter with you. And also the important part of the occupations, um, it's different for different ages. So for example, a person that is um, living alone and they need help, they might not work anymore, but for children, it's important to play. So this is also a part that we emphasize to make it person-centered. In OT, can, you can make use of OT across your lifespan. So the different spheres in your life, um, we work with everyone throughout their life and you can make use of an OT. So the first field of practice that we can um, go into is pediatric, is also the most well-known. Um, so pediatric occupational therapists focus on children's development and helping them participate in their daily activities. Common conditions that we work with includes OT, include autism, sensory processing disorders, and developmental delays. Interventions often involve play-based activities because that's what children do, they play, and we play with children to improve their motor skills, coordination, and sensory processing. So next we're going to look at the mental health aspect of occupational therapy. So mental health OTs address mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, and schizophrenia. Therapists focus on improving coping skills, social interaction, and daily functioning through various therapeutic approaches and interventions. Physical OT, rehabilitation and physical health address conditions such as spinal cord injury, so that's normally what we see people using wheelchairs, amputation, and orthopedic injuries. Therapists work on mobility training adaptive equipment, and assistive devices to improve functional independence. Physical and neuro-occupational therapists also work very closely with physios, and maybe you have seen um, hand therapists. They make splints and pressure garments, so this is also part of physical. In vocational rehabilitation, um, I just want to add that the University of Pretoria is the only university that at vocational rehab in our undergrad program. So if this is something you are interested in uh, from a different university, you'll have to do your postgrad at the University of Pretoria. So vocational rehabilitation helps individuals with disabilities prepare for, obtain, and maintain employment. This area involves skills training, job coaching, and workplace recommendation to support successful integration into the workplace. And then we have community. So Shanae and I are currently working in our community block and we are working in Mama Lodi. Um, we are working at Cosa sites and we're also working at the Old Age Home. In rural communities, occupational therapy services encompass home-based interventions tailored to individual living in environments, agriculture and vocational support, community outreach programs, promoting health and wellness and environmental modifications to enhance accessibility and safety within homes and community spaces. Here we have the requirements to study occupational therapy at the University of Pretoria. So the compulsory subjects that you need are English, mathematics, physics, chemistry, and then you'll have, this is only the minimum requirement, so that would be a three or a D. Um, I see the GCE calls it an E, and then um, it could be between a 15 and a 59, but we also want to add the OT program is a very competitive program um, to be part of. There are only 50 students that they take in first year. So this is just the minimum requirements. We have a few references. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, any questions? How many years to me? 
they want to ask how many years do they need to study at the University of Pretoria to become an occupational therapist? Oh, yes. Can you um, from um, side? Sorry, say again. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Christina, nobody asking questions that side. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Inga. And I'm sorry, just thank you very much for your time and I appreciate it. I recorded it, I will share it then with the students that's not here. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye, uh, bye-bye. I don't see Alfred Kasi yet. Um, Dr. Nina Menacha, will you be able to to over now, please? Thank you. With pleasure, Dr. Matina. The sound for me is very bad. Can you all hear me? We can hear you clearly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me see if I can share screen. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I wonder if you can see uh, my, my PowerPoint. Can you see yes. it full screen? Yeah, uh, not full screen, but we can not see it, not full screen. Um, let me see if I can run it. Um, slide show. Okay. Can you see it full screen now? Yeah, yeah thank perfect. you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so... Um, I'm uh, Nita Menacher. I am from the Department Informatics at the University of Pretoria. This is quite an interesting department because I think it's the only department in the university that stands with its legs in, in two faculties. We're in the Faculty Engineering and also in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. And I'll tell you why. Because a career in informatics actually teaches you how to work with computers while in business. Because informatics is a study of using computers in business. So what is informatics? It's almost like the future. It's a bridge to everything that is useful. Informatics is a study of the behavior and structure of any system, computer system, that generates, stores, processes, and presents information. So you can call it the science of information. So the field takes into consideration the interaction between information systems and the user. It's not just the computer, it's the human who uses the computer as well. So the word informatics comes from the German word informatik, which actually means computer science. But these days it's 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 moved into a more general use. Um, you see that not everyone uses the word the same. It, it, informatics means different things in different uh, organizations. Um, but all of these different ways still refer to using information systems in business and in everyday processes. So basically, informatics harnesses the power and possible of, possibility of digital technology to transform data and information into knowledge that people use every day but it has a strong focus on the human use of computing. Um, nearly every area of our life these days has computers. Have you seen that? There is not even the person next to the road selling vegetables is without a computer because he uses the most wonderful computer of all. This cell phone is more powerful than the computer that put people on the moon. So computing is part of our daily life. And that is why people who study informatics can go into just about any career. And this is a little picture that we have on our department's um, website where we say informatics is uh, finally, there's a degree study program. Um, 
designed for students who love computers, but they like people even more. And can you see the awesome careers that you can follow? Developer, systems analyst, data analyst, business analyst. You can be a researcher like um, most of us are. You can be a business manager. You can be a compliance officer or auditor here. And can I just mention to you, the most important thing to get in here is to work hard on your mathematics at school. Your mathematics is like the basis for everything. And it's very, very important that you do well here. And then it is very easy for you to move into the field of informatics. Um, and that seems to be almost the end of the slides. So basically, we can ask, is informatics a profession? Well, you can go into any profession with informatics. It opens a wide range of career opportunities. You can do jobs at technology companies and build information systems or at nonprofits or at um, in industry. But you can also go to government. You can go to civil service. You can even go to uh, academia. Basically, the world is your oyster. Opportunities don't happen. You create them. And I hope... You I hope we see you at informatics. I would glad to answer any questions with regards to that. Thank you, Dr. Nita. That was very, very good. We got a big sound system now, so everyone can hear. Um, I'm, I'm so glad. To ask, um, if somebody here ask, I have a question, then I'd leave it over to Christine. Any questions from your side? Okay, they're all fine. I'm leaving it over to Christy if you got quick. Great. Yeah, we will uh, move on to some of our professors that we have here at Merrimack College. And uh, Cindy, would you mind presenting next? I don't think Laura has joined us yet. Sure, I would love to. Let me get my slides open. is it okay how does that look right we can see okay. it great so um hello my name is cindy carlson and i'm a professor of the uh, department of civil engineering over at merrimack which as dr dobbs mentioned is just outside of boston in massachusetts um, these are some pictures of our students and our programs um, we have a lot of fun Civil engineering is a very hands-on career as well as um, program, especially at Merrimack. And I, I know that you have a, a program at the University of Pretoria in civil engineering as well. Um, this is kind of the general overview, first of all, like what is a civil engineer? What do they do? Um, so engineers in general um, apply math and science. So you'll need strong math and science skills. Um, but we solve real world problems. Um, so we certainly use informatics. Um, <laughs> we think about people's occupations, um, but sort of laid over top of that is that we're looking for real world problems in, um, in, the, in civilizations basically is why it's civil engineering. Um, so a, a description of civil engineers would be to design and maintain infrastructure, meaning sort of pipes and roads and buildings, um, things that are used by um, civilizations. We also care about the environment, so how people and the infrastructure interact with the environment. Um, you may have heard of mechanical engineers. That's a little bit different. Um, they design and manufacture mechanical systems, so they're on a maybe smaller scale, um, looking at cars or manufacturing. Um, or you may have heard of electrical and computer engineers. Um, they design and apply electrical and computer systems. So I'm a civil engineer um, right in that middle. I'm specifically an environmental engineer, which is a subset of civil. Um, there's a couple other different subsets, um, and I'll touch on all of them because I know I, my talk is about civil engineering. Um, and so I, I'll save my favorite environmental engineering to the end. I'll talk about all the different kind of branches of civil. Um, this includes transportation and development, um, structural engineering, which is probably the one that th people think of most often when they think of civil engineering, sort of buildings and bridges and things like that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about geotechnical engineering, which will be 
um, foundations and strengths of soils, um, which is something people don't even realize is going on, um, but is kind of exciting. Um, and then of course, the best one, environmental and water resources. Um, so transportation and development, um, again, a subset of civil engineers. Some people really, really like trying to think about how to move people and products from one place to another. Um, and that can mean designing rail stations. So how can you more efficiently move people? Um, trains are very, very efficient, um, but a lot of people really like their personal cars, so we can't get rid of those quite yet. Um, and so we have some pictures of highways. Transportation engineers will um, design how that curve should look and how high those bridges need to be to safely carry people from point A to point B, things you don't even really think about. Um, I al always say civil engineers, if you're doing your job right, people don't even notice. Um, so thinking about pedestrians, like how can we move pedestrians safely amongst their neighborhood and around the community um, while still moving the cars? Um, so making sure that everybody has a fair shot at moving their community. Um, civil engineers think a lot about um, social justice and trying to make sure that everyone has access to the, the goods and the services that they need, um, including you know, transportation is a very important um, service that people, people need to have. Um, and then here, just planning out houses. So that's where the development piece gets to, to come. Like, where should industry be? Where should stores and houses be? And how can people move between those two spaces comfortably? Um, in the past, we tried to keep those very separate, like, okay, commercial is here and housing is here. And more and more, we're realizing that it actually works better if they're close together so people can walk from their house to the store. And we don't need to have a, a downtown district that is separate from where, where people live. Um, it's better if people live near where they're going to be spending their days. Um, so in general, civil engineers plan routes. We analyze transportation systems. We try to move people in goods. Um, here's an example local to me, um, thinking about the, the Central Artery Project. If you were from my region, you would uh, know about this uh, project called the Big Dig. Um, it took a lot of years to try to uh, make sure that people could quickly move through the urban center of Boston. And that's a lot of civil engineering went into that project. Um, and I also tried to find examples of projects that were near you. This one looks like maybe it, it hasn't quite come to fruition. So I'm sure there's a lot of civil engineers kind of thinking about the planning of um, how to get more development um, on Route 10. It looks like there's a lot of potential opportunity there. Um, I love the way it's um, engineers love color. So <laughs> trying to make uh, the different types of buildings look um, kind of vibrant and, and encourage people to, uh, engineers have to work a lot of regulations. So they're trying to encourage the government to approve different plans, trying to get things that will meet people's needs in the future um, moved forward. All right, so structural engineering is, as I mentioned, probably the one people think of first. Um, we are able to. So generally, if you're a civil engineer, you'll focus on one of these things. Um, so at, so at Merrimack College, if you graduate with a degree in civil engineering, and I'm sure it's similar at the University of Pretoria, you come out with skills in all four of these, but then from there, your career will focus on one. So if you're interested in structural engineering, um, you're going to be designing buildings. So it's at a smaller scale than the transportation and development um, folks. So instead of thinking about where do things go, you're thinking about that individual building. How can I make that strong enough to hold up what people um, want to put in it? So a library with a lot of books and computers and people, it needs to be stronger than a house, which has um, a lot more open space, for example, and a lot uh, less heavy things. Um, this over here, this is not a civil engineer. This would be a construction worker. Um, but the civil engineer would have planned out how many bolts need to go into this joint and how big does that joint need to be and, and how what kind of materials we can use for that flange. Um, and then a lot of those joints go into a building that's this size. This is um, a uh, 18 billion, and I, I won't try for the R, 
um, but Salva Cop <laughs> government district um, nearby you that's going up. Um, some, some more examples, bridges. I love bridges. A lot of times I found that students want to study engineering um, because they love bridges. So um, the Nelson Mandela Bridge um, is a famous one in Johannesburg. And our Zakem Bridge um, is a famous one in Boston. And you can see they have different styles, right? And so different styles of bridges go into different locations. Um, and there's different reasons for the different styles. And engineers would decide both based on aesthetics, like which one do we think will look prettier there? But also really importantly, which one is safer there? Which one has the characteristics that we think are going to work best there? Um, and then engineers will, uh, determine, they'll calculate how much um, strength each of these poles need that are, for instance, in the Nelson Mandela Bridge, um, and then what material they need to be, how many of them we need, um, for example. So down here in the bottom corner, I have uh, a bridge that was destroyed by an earthquake. Um, and so that's another uh, thing that civil engineers need to worry about. So it's not just the load on it, the people and the cars and so forth, but it's also what kind of natural situation is that bridge going to be in? Um, so thinking about earthquake resistance or um, tidal wave resistance, or as sea levels rise, how are we going to make structures that are strong enough to deal with larger storms due to climate change? Um, so these are all things that civil engineers think about and, and worry about um, because it's it's important. It's um, loss of life can happen when, when our structures fail. All right, so the third branch I wanted to talk about is geotechnical engineering. And this is one maybe people don't even realize is there. It's thinking about the things that are under the structures and under the development. So what kind of soils are you building on? What are those soils best suited for? Um, so here's a famous example of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, it leans because of its foundation. So you can see it's a thicker area of clay under the area that's sinking. Um, clay is a weaker material. And so because of that difference in strength between um, the, the left side and the right side, as we're looking at it, um, that, that weaker material, that um, additional weak material underneath the area that's sinking, and that's causing that to happen. And you can picture how this is not something that we want to happen with buildings that we, we uh, it's fabulous for this, it's a, a tourist destination, but that's not what they intended. Um, the engineers were probably pretty sad when they started seeing that happen. So we really need to try to think about stability. Um, if we were to build a building like this today, we might, um, as seen sort of in this top left corner, uh, drill piles, we call them. So like through the clay so that um, we have something that's strong to hold up that side of the building. And then hopefully it won't have that differential collapsing. Um, another thing that uh, geotechnical engineers work on is uh, something you would call retaining structures or you might call retaining wall. Um, and so here's a, a huge example for one. Um, this is a, a little ways from you, but it was big enough that I, I wanted to point it out. Um, it's 41 feet or 12.6 uh, meters high. That's a huge retaining wall. And you can see behind it, there's soil. So it's retaining the soil. A lot of engineering goes into how strong can I make that um, retaining wall. And you can picture, again, thinking about earthquakes or flooding or additional water coming in, um, having the groundwater pushing on that retaining wall. It takes a lot of calculations to make sure that that wall is going to be able to stay firm and stay strong and, and protect whatever they're going to put under here, um, a road. So, you know, protecting life, protecting the environment. And then here's mine, my favorite one, environmental and water resources. Um, and I could probably break this one up into just as many branches as civil engineering. There's there's so much you can do with a civil engineering degree. Um, once you're getting down into the in environmental and water resources, you can think about um, drinking water treatment for people, wastewater treatment for, well, pr protects the environment from the people. Um, here's a picture of the Dasport wastewater treatment plant. Um, so when you flush the toilet or take a shower or wash your dishes, all of that water that goes down the drain, it has to go somewhere and it needs to be treated before we can release it because it has things in it that you can imagine we don't want to just release into the environment or into the, the Appies River. 
So the Dasport Wastewater Treatment Plan and wastewater treatment plants all around the world protect the environment from things that humans put down in the sewers. And how do they do it? They do it with biology. We have lots of little microorganisms breaking up that material. Um, they do it with chemicals. Um, they do it with even just aeration. So you can see these are aeration tanks. Um, so again, this is a, a lot of work goes into designing these. Um, I love them. Maybe you will too. Um, but trying to get tr uh, clean drinking water to humans also takes a lot of treatment. So here is um, the R Levy uh, Nature Preserve, and there's a big um, pond there. And I expanded here, you can see there's a dam and there's a water treatment plant. So treating that water before it goes to humans, but also making sure that we protect the environment. So um, the, I hippos. There are hippos in your nature preserve. That's so cool. And zebras and, and emu, I think that I even saw, and you have some lot. Anyway, so protecting that for people and for the environment. There's also fishing there. Um, so trying to make sure um, that we protect the environment, we protect people, but also do it. Um, engineers also have to worry about finances. So making sure that we do it in a fiscally responsible manner, um, currently, the city of Tishwani produces um, only 12.5% of its own water, which means they need to buy it from elsewhere because we all need water. So thinking about how can we expand this drinking water treatment plant, um, that would be civil engineers thinking about that. Maybe need to upgrade the dam. That would be civil engineers thinking about that. And when there's a problem, there's a big problem. Um, so here's an example of um, the city of Tishwani failed to maintain their wastewater plants and it led to pollution. Um, when that is a problem, then um, fauna and flora, so that's the animals and the plants had problems. People and animals had problems, got diseases. Cholera is a, a really, it, it's still an important um, concern all over the world. Um, and it's especially important for the elderly and kids. Um, but this is not something that is only happening in your area. I pulled out some examples from the U.S. Um, so um, here's an example from Los Angeles. And uh, notice that yours was a couple of years ago. The one that I pulled up was yesterday. Um, so you're not alone in having issues with, with sewage spills. And that's a civil engineering thing. We'll have to be um, the ones that are getting in there and repairing and making sure it doesn't happen again. Um, here's one that's right on the border of Mexico and the U.S. And, you know, Africa and North America are not the only issues. Um, I found this one uh, in Welsh. Uh, Wales. Yeah, Welsh is the um, adjective. Um, so civil engineers, when we do our job right, nobody hears about it. But as soon as we do something wrong, um, as it should be, it's in the news. Um, and so we really, um, it's important work. It's its work that helps protect um, the people and the environment, like I've been saying. Um, and it's gonna become more and more important. So um, I saw this slide about things that so, um, South Africa is going to be addressing in the next few decades and the world is going to be having to um, deal with climate change, um, with land use issues with water use, that's a really big concern in South Africa. And that's been in the news a lot. Civil engineers are front and center in that um, pollution. The the energy uh, that you're talking about, your, your um, brownouts to try to reduce load, civil engineers are right front and center in that. Um, so overall, civil engineers help plan for everyday life. And we also help plan and reduce the destruction from natural disasters, whether it's um, earthquakes or uh, that bottom picture is uh, Hawaii after recent wildfires that just took out every single building. Um, and civil engineers will have to get in there and help rebuild and help plan to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, so overall, what do we do? Um, we build civilizations and we protect people and the environment. And it is a career that is so flexible. Um, so I showed you a lot of the career paths that would follow along from if you stayed working in your field. Um, so working at a consulting firm, doing development work or structural work or water resources work. Um, government agencies need civil engineers. Um, working for the city, as you can see, the, the city is the, the, in the U.S. at least, these are the people who generally run the, the wastewater and the drinking water treatment plants, or they may 
be helping um, with the developing and approving different things. Um, but also down the bottom here, we need more civil engineers in politics. Uh, civil engineers kind of understand how all of these things fit together. We have really good critical thinking skills and practical skills. And can you imagine if more politicians were, were practical and understood um, where finances should go and what the importance of different projects would be? Um, we need more engineers in education and in technology. Um, so I, I, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I really feel that you can do anything with a civil engineering degree. It's a really um, good place to start your, your career. And it's interesting and um, I'm passionate about it. And with that, um, I'll see if there are any questions. Let me see if I can stop sharing. Great, thank you, Cindy. It makes me want to be a civil engineer. <laughs> want to do the important does. work. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Any of our students or in the audience or any of our other people who have joined us virtually? Oh, there's one. Ah. Go ahead, loveness. Um, I have a oh, sorry, Martina, are you online? I thought you might be so, We're still here. Yeah. The power just gets on, but it takes now as a while for to to lock up. Well, I've got a question. Yeah, how much specialty is this needed in which to qualify for the program? So they want to know what is the percentage to have in maths to qualify for a civil engineer? I think that may be a, a South Africa specific question, but I'll say that um at, at Merrimack. Um, students generally come in starting with Calculus 1. Um, I don't know if that gets at what you're asking about. So our program is four years. They take Calculus 1, 2, 3, differential equations and statistics. Um, we don't have at Merrimack, we don't have a, a cutoff where we say you cannot enter engineering if you don't have this grade in math. Um, but they may have something like that at the University of Pretoria. I don't know if someone from there can answer that. May I add to that, please? Um, uh, our department, uh, informatics, is in the engineering faculty, and we have a cutoff percentage of 60% school um, metric label mathematics. Great, thank you. And Loveness has a question on the end of that. Um, How much good day. Um, good day. I wanted to ask that. I wanted to ask that when you're doing engineering, right? What kind of punishments do they give you when you like fail in your work? Let's say, for example, you're building the road, but then there's something missing in the road, and then they that causes accidents. Yeah, what kind of punishment? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. Um, first of all, let me say, because it's so important, so many people are checking your work. So you do not need to worry that, oh, you know, I'm going to make a mistake. N no, 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 no. Like you, we work in teams. Civil engineers always work in teams. There's always a lot of people checking to make sure that there wasn't a mistake. So, so there's no worry about that. Um, generally, if there is sort of a like an, a, a really bad mistake, like maybe somebody tried to hide something on purpose and um, you know did something that was um, sneaky rather like, so if you made an honest mistake, people will check it, it will be fixed. But if you did something sneaky and wrong, um, you can lose your license. <clears throat> so what that means is, I don't know if you saw at the beginning, <clears throat> my, I have a license, I'm a professional engineer. And so I uh, went through a lot of training and I took a license test. I actually took two <laughs> um, and I became a, a licensed engineer and I can lose my license if I do something that's sneaky. Someone decides that it's unethical um, and then I couldn't be an engineer anymore. Um, so I wouldn't, I if, you know, I'm sure there's something you, you could do bad enough to go to jail, but that wouldn't be making a mistake. If you make a mistake, it's an honest mistake and, and people will catch it for you. There's there's no concern about that. But if I try to be unethical, then I can either lose my license or potentially go to jail. I don't know. Does that for answer? How many you? years? How many years have, have you been working as an engineer? Ah, good question. So I worked um, as an engineer uh, for about 10 years and now I've been teaching for about 10 years. 
So I guess I've been an engineer for about 20 years, maybe more. <laughs> it feels like more sometimes. Interesting. <laughs> Go ahead, Kitso. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, may I please ask? Um, I'm actually interested in becoming a doctor, but I am not quite sure if whether I want to study in the medical, like specifically in the medical field and either actually specialize in the medical field. So um, during the virtual exchange, um, I actually learned about um, the biomedical engineering and I felt like it was I was more interested in it because um, the, the, the idea of maybe one day why, um, while I'm working and then I lose a patient or something is like one of the most, I would say, stressful um, things to, that I would actually experience. So ma'am, um, what I'm actually asking is that, um, could you talk more about the biomedical engineering if possible? Sure, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, I'll start by saying I kind of was in the same situation as you. I wanted to be a veterinarian and I thought, you know, it would really break my heart if I had to lose a, a dog or a cat and I would just be sad every single day. So how can I help animals and the environment without like helping them not one on one, but helping them more broadly? Um, and so I decided to go into environmental engineering because now I can help whole habitats of animals rather than just individual animals. And I, yeah. I think that's kind of what you're saying as far as the medical field. Yes. Um, and so um, I don't know a whole lot about biomedical. I know that um, you probably, it's probably more than just a four year degree. Um, mm -hmm. So at, for instance, at Merrimack, you would study mechanical engineering so that you can understand yeah. like how things move together, how <laughs> joints yeah. move. Um, and, and about materials. And then you might get a graduate degree specifically looking at what sorts of things you want to look at, like designing yeah. hands or designing um, pumps for insulin or, you know, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so I recommend you find a biomedical engineer and, and talk to them more about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I appreciate the response. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions before we move to our next speaker, which will be Dr. Laura Shu, who's gonna to talk to us about careers in human development and human services. And if you have questions and we don't get to them, just hold on to them. And if we have time at the end, we'll open up for a general discussion. So Laura, I'll go ahead and, and uh, hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Shu, and I'm going to be presenting on human development and human services. And um, Dr. Dobbs, it looks like I'm not able to screen share. Um, so if there's a way that I could do that, that would be great. But otherwise, you, I know you have my slides too, so we could do it that way. Yeah, let me, I'll share my screen right now. Okay, great. Hope you're all having a good day so far. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. So, so human development is a really broad field, but what the field really is looking at is how people change as, what, as well as their, how they remain the same from infancy through adulthood. And there's so many factors that influence a person's development, including their genetics, their schooling experiences, their family experiences, the environment that they live in. So it is a very broadly applied field. And fundamentally, what we're interested in is promoting healthy development physically, cognitively, which is the way we think, and socially and emotionally. Now, some people ask, what's the difference between human development and psychology? So psychology is also a very broad field. And human development is a branch of psychology, or it's an offshoot of psychology, specifically developmental psychology. Um, but we take a more applied approach, which means that we want to learn about how people develop and then use what use that knowledge in order to um, to help people live better and healthier lives. We're also really interested in what we all have the same universally as humans and and also cross culturally how we differ because we feel like that, provides a lens into 
um, what evolutionarily has um, helped us as humans to adapt and what has promoted healthy survival, um, but also how our culture and how our environment shapes us in really profound ways from some of the more micro factors like you know, the food we eat, the language we speak, to more macro factors like our political systems and um, our philosophies about individualism and our group orientations. Um, so for the next slide, um, so we look at development throughout the whole lifespan. As I tell my students, from womb to tomb, really from even before the time people are born, and preconception all the way until death. Um, but really we look at each stage one at a time when we're studying human development, starting in infancy, which is about birth to 12 months, and then toddlerhood, 12 months to three years old, childhood, three to 12 years old, adolescence from 12 to 18, and adulthood 18 plus. Of course, these ages might differ cross-culturally, but in the United States, this is typically um, how we define these developmental periods. And we're very interested in how people grow and change over time because as you all know, probably from your own personal experiences, the, the way that you grew up, the family that you grew up in, whether you had siblings, the schools that you went to, the neighborhood that you uh, grew up in, all of those have such important influences on shaping who you are. And so when we understand how someone developed and the different influences in their lives, we can better understand sort of where they're going. And, and so we're very interested in that trajectory or that sort of developmental track and pathway that people take. Now, sometimes um, in if you do research or when you go into the workforce, you might be really interested in working with a particular age group. Some of my students want to be elementary school teachers. And so they're very interested in the childhood period. I have some students who are really interested in working with teenagers and adolescents, um, especially those that are, are maybe having a hard time with mental health. Um, and so they wanna be therapists or they wanna work in a group home um, where there are teenagers who maybe had some challenges with their family life and they're living separately. Um, I have students who want to work with aging populations and work in homes with senior citizens and older adults, um, some who need more assistance than others. Um, so there's a really broad range um, of, of career opportunities that you can have in this field. And we're really interested in educating people about each of these different developmental stages in terms of their, their physical growth and development, how they think over time, um, and how they develop relationships and can develop healthy relationships. Um, next slide, please. So we look at a lot of different factors in development. So genetics being one of them. And genetics is such an interesting field because there's a lot of technology now that is allowing for genes to be edited and for us to develop a greater understanding of how our genes can even change um, and alter the future development of a child. Um, so for example, I recently showed my students a, a documentary um, that showed that during World War II, during the Dutch famine, women who were pregnant um, ended up having children with a higher risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, simply from experiencing um, being pregnant during the famine. And it altered the genes that were switched on and off over time. Um, so, so we're very interested in how genes interact with the environment in shaping future development, how we can have be born with certain predispositions um, or tendencies, and then how that can, that can really um, change and alter our development. We talk a lot about personality too. So for example, someone who, who has, um, who's born a little more introverted, which means they get their energy from being alone. If they grew up um, as an only child, for example, and they're inheriting that tendency from their parents too, because personality is somewhat genetic. 
then we tend to sometimes select environments that just reinforce those existing predispositions. Um, whereas someone who is born more extroverted will select environments that tend to have more people, um, you know, that they, they tend to be more sociable and outgoing. Um, but family factors can change that too. For example, if you um, have a parent, maybe you're born more introverted, but you have a parent who took you to a lot of play dates and um, you had a lot of siblings, maybe you become, on, at least on the surface, more outgoing. We're also interested in, um, in fetal health. And as Dr. Carlson was talking about engineering and um, sustainability and the environments that, um, that make it a, a safe environment for people to live in, um, I was thinking about how important the environment is for in terms of where people are growing up. And we're very interested too in diversity and inequities. So for example, we know that people who live in more low-income areas tend to be exposed more to pollution and um, might have uh, in more environmental challenges. Uh, in some cases, lead has been found um, in water. And so that definitely affects the, the health of not only developing children um, in the womb, but also children who are um, living in those communities. So children and individuals who live in those communities, for example, with higher pollution tend to have more asthma. So we're very interested in, in that as well. Um, we're interested in the identities of individuals and how they're shaped by different demographic factors like race, socioeconomic status, religion, sex and gender, all of those intersect to really shape who the individual is. Um, and in our life experiences, all of all of those, um, the friendships we develop, um, you know, all of those life experiences that interact with all the factors I mentioned really um, determine a lot of our uh, of our development and our trajectory and where it's going. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, and so this is this slide really just epitomizes uh, a theory that I teach my students um, about human development that. We have the individual, we have individual factors, and they're nested within these different systems that get larger and larger over time. And you'll notice that the arrows go back and forth. And that's because not only do we influence the environment, but the environment influences us. So for example, with the macro system, you know, if we think about our political system, we, um, for those of you that are eligible to vote, you can um, you vote to determine who the candidate is, who then determines a lot of the policies, um, of the country, and in turn, those policies affect us. Um, so all the way from the, the minuscule, the sort of micro, to all the way to the macro, the media, how does the media shape our perceptions of ourselves, our perceptions of other people, um, and, and then the ways that all of those factors interact. And that there's a really long name next to it, Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Bronfenbrenner, he's considered the founder um, and founding father of human development, so to speak. Um, and that is why I include it in, included it in this slide. But human development is a very multidisciplinary field. There are a lot of different um, disciplines that we draw from, including sociology and education and psychology. Um, this is the primary one, but we talk about other theories as well. Um, next slide. Um, thank you. So ultimately, our, our goal is to promote healthy development and using all of this knowledge to do that. And it is a large task because there are, um, depending on the age group that you're focusing on or the setting, you know, usually we focus um, on a particular role, a particular setting and a particular population. And that's usually what I ask my advisees when they're thinking about what they want to do with this major um, is what do you see yourself doing? Do you see yourself more in a leadership role? in a supportive role, maybe as a counselor, um, or, or being in a classroom and helping a student who might have learning disabilities, for example, what setting do you see yourself in? Do you see yourself maybe in a hospital or a school or maybe a home setting? And uh, and so those, those questions hopefully help. And then what age group are you interested in working with? Some people are very open open-ended, you know, and, and don't have a strong preference, which will provide more career opportunities. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities in the human services field, which I'll talk about in a minute. Next slide, please. 
So these are some different career paths and settings that some of our students enter. A lot of our students, so in, in Massachusetts, in the state in which we teach, our students have to double major in Edu if they're an education major and want to teach from kindergarten to high school, they have to major in something else. So they often will major in human development um, because it gives a really nice complement to the, the knowledge that they need to teach a particular age group. Um, so a lot of our students go into teaching, um, but there are a lot of other pathways as well. Some that you can go into right after undergrad and some that you will need more advanced training in graduate school. So some of our students go into um, child life specialization, which is um, where they work in a hospital and they help a child who's about to get a medical procedure. They play games, they color with them, they try to calm them down. Um, and so there are special programs for that. Social work, um, counseling, school counselors, mental health counselors, community engagement, speech and language pathology, working with individuals who have challenges speaking from an early age or being able to formulate words. And there could be a variety of reasons behind that. K through 12 education, higher education, working in a college setting. And then on the right, these are some sample work settings that some of our students have worked in. Community organizations, childcare and education centers, drug and alcohol treatment, child and domestic abuse centers, elder care, even human resource departments of companies, anything really having to do with people. Um, so, so thank you so much for your attention and your time. Um, those are all the slides I have. If any of you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I have a question. Yes, and sure. I'd like to ask. Okay, so my first question is, does human development relate with human behavioral sciences? Yes, absolutely. We're very interested in, in human behavior. And um, in terms of a scientist, um, I'm curious in, uh, to get more information about um, what you mean by by scientist. Um, what I mean is that like there are different kinds of scientists mm -hmm. and there are different kinds of fields in science, right? Yes. There is physical scientists and there are also the human behavioral scientists. Like there's different kinds of scientists actually. So by what I mean, I mean like human development. It's like human behavior which other scientists deal with. So do they like relate in some way or is it totally different um, cause something like that? Well, that's a great question. So human developmentalists certainly use science a lot in informing their decisions and the way and the practices that they use. They're not usually considered scientists uh, per se. Um, they're more considered psychologists, I would say. But they definitely use um, some principles of science. Um, some are very interested in the physical development of individuals, for example. So they'll use um, biology. So for example, if a, if a pregnant woman was um, using drugs during her pregnancy, they would be very interested in how that would affect the developing fetus over time. Another thing um, that has been, um, that in terms of human behavior, there's a there's a practice called applied behavior analysis, ABA, that's been used with autistic individuals where they shape human behavior using principles of what's called positive reinforcement. So anytime um, an autistic individual, someone who's neurodivergent, maybe someone with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is doing a behavior that they think is desirable, then they'll, they'll, they'll praise them, they'll clap, they'll give them a reward. Um, and sometimes those are called behavior technicians. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Loveness, but, but it was a great question. Um, Thank you. I can at least tell you we are back on air and we've got power again. <laughs> so the students said they will type in questions if they have questions. So most of them are locking still in, but... Um, I don't know, let me just hear about that one girl, she said she's going to type a question, just a moment. Sure. While we wait, I have another question, eh? Sure. Uh, do you think that your blood group has anything to do with your human development? Oh, sorry, Loveness, could you repeat that? Something group relating to human development? I was saying that, do you think that your blood group has anything to do with your development, with your human development? 
Oh, okay. So by blood group, do you mean like what type of blood you have? Yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I know that certain blood types are like O positive, um, that you're able to be a universal donor, for example. I definitely think it it shapes certain propensities or um, vulnerabilities perhaps to um, certain conditions. So for pregnant women, for example, if they have a certain blood type, um, sometimes it's incompatible with the developing fetus and they have to get certain shots. Um, so there are certainly situations where blood type can affect development. Yeah, great. Okay. Dr. Dobbs, I know we're kind of pressed for time. Yeah, st students that are joining us online, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And then at the end, we can go back to those questions that are in the chat and sort of go, go through them. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to our last presenter, Dr. Ann Gatling, who's going to talk to us about STEM education career pathways. All right. Oh, hello. Let me get my little slideshow set up here. Let me escape and get out there. And hello, everyone. I have loved hearing all the different careers. And I, what I love about what I do is I help get everyone ready to go to that. And so we try to let everyone have an opportunity to, um, to have access to any career they want. And if they have STEM, if there's something that just sparks their interest, they can they can go anywhere. And so science education, STEM education is really exciting right now. There's so much happening. And um, Martina and I have actually been talking about a lot of this too. And so anyway, let me get started. Can you all see my slideshow? Let me make it into a slideshow. Okay. So I am Ann Gatling, and I also teach at Merrimack College with Cindy and Laura and we, and, and we, we, Christy, we just all have a lot of fun. We, we collaborate and really think through things together and working with students in the community. And so anyway, my students, we have a lot of fun. We do hikes um, as, as a class with science education. We get outside, we do research, we get to think about what are, what's in the woods and what, how do those systems interact? But we also have to learn through things, right? And so Science as we knew it, so in science as most of us grew up, was pretty much we would learn the vocabulary. So we would learn everything about sounds, for instance. We would learn waves and vibration. Whoops, I have waves twice. Anyway, and um, so then we would do our investigations. So we would do like the tuning fork in the water and see it flash around. And then we'd do a tuning fork and bounce it. And then we'd see how it would make the ping pong ball fly. And then we put these little strings on our ears. This is what the exploratorium and and um, San Francisco does. They have the. It's one of their famous um, centers at their at the museum. And so you put two little strings in your ear, and you have it on a hanger, and you bang it on the on the table, and it's phenomenal what you hear. And so, but this is what we would do. We maybe we'd learn the vocabulary, we get to do the explorations, and then maybe we would do a test, right? Okay. So that's what we grew up with. But now, with our new next year's generation science standards, which the whole United States has adopted, everything has flipped upside down completely upside down, totally backwards. What do we do? Well, now we have something we call sense making. And sense making works whether you're working with a little two-year-old or someone who's 18, even someone who's a senior citizen, it does not matter. It's helping us to slow down and really think about what's going on. So for example, let's go back to our sound. What if we did something like this? So sound for first grade is investigations provide evidence that vibrating materials can make sound and sound can make materials vibrate and then develop a model about waves in fourth grade. But instead of doing all of that, all we do at the very beginning of any unit is a phenomena. And for sound, one of the most exciting phenomena that we've had for a while for sound is this man who loves to tap the glass match the pitch with his voice and sing loud enough that he breaks the glass. And he's very elaborate and very loud. And all the kids start laughing. They're like, what? what's going on? Which is exactly what you want. Wait a minute, what is happening here? So the only thing we do is show this video and then ask, what do you notice? And what questions do you have? So they sit and they work together and they work on their own little papers and they're writing and then draw a model. What do you think's happening? So then they draw and they try to draw the glass and they try to draw, there's a straw that he has in there that you can't see. And they try to draw maybe the, the voice going to the glass and things like this. And then they talk about it. Well, then they write down their questions 
or they've written down their questions and then they take their questions and they go up. Oops, let's see if I can go down to the next slide. Um, there we go. Then this is, a, this is a board that actually would be over a whole unit. So at the beginning, it would just be about a fourth of these post-its, but they take all their questions up to the board and they look at the ones and they say, which one would be the most, the best question that we could design an investigation around? What's our best question here? And so after all the little things that they've looked at and they talk through, typically it works to, what if the sound, do you think sound needs a medium? Now, if you notice, I have does crossed off here. This is one of the biggest things about teaching right now. It's putting the load on the students. If I ask you, does sound need a medium to travel? You're like, I'm not sure. You know it, you know it, why do I need to answer it? But if I ask, do you think sound needs a medium to travel? Then the student's like, I don't know. Maybe it does, but if you're in space, but, but if you're in the water, and so then it gives them that freedom to be like, what I have to say has meaning. I have the ability to give something to this conversation. So I'm always working with my students. Do you think instead of does, you know, so just think, keep that in the back of your mind. This is good for whatever, if you babysit or if you do anything. So anyway, now, so then the vocabulary isn't done up front. The vocabulary is happening as you're doing the investigations, as they're doing it. Look, the rice is shaking, shaking as I hit it with the tuning fork or the water's moving. There's something, it's, it's moving, look at that. And eventually you start to bring in the vocabulary and you bring in that vocabulary as they're talking and then you can pull them together and say, well, you know, when that rice or that water was slipping around or that ping pong ball was flashing or that we heard different hangers doing different kinds of things in our ears. Oh, those, that's called vibrations. That movement is called vibrations and you work in and those waves are going through. So anyway, I don't want to, I hope you're getting the sense. So it goes, phenomena, whatever your phenomena is, you're, then the questions, then you do the investigation. Now we weave in that vocabulary. So now what we do, so what I love about science is that you don't only just do, and science sometimes doesn't get taught. So you have to help the teachers figure out ways to bring in other things. So how do we bring in sound literacy? Well, you talk about a cricket poem and that the crickets have their little ears on their legs. Could you imagine? What if we all did that? And then this little book also tells a little bit about other animals that have vibration or sound that they do. And then you have things like all these kinds of books for little ones doing sound. If you were doing it with older ones, you'd have older books about sound. But anyway, and then little things like, what can you find that is around sound? Oh my gosh, well, you hear we have Kandinsky, who when he saw sounds, when he saw colors, he heard sounds. And so Google did this huge thing to where if you touch the, the colors, they tried to say that red was this really loud, but the yellows were more of a soft sound. And so just helping kids to think about sound in so many ways. And sound can now be used to put out fire, but can we do that application for forest fires? Think about the power of that. Or, or on the space station, fire is the biggest concern they have on the face, space station. And, and if you just sprayed the regular stuff, it just would go everywhere. But if we could do sound to help disrupt what's going on in the fire, then um, it was a much better thing. So these have, it's been developed at a university and those guys are trying really hard to make it so it works at a bigger level. So those kinds of things inspire the kids like, oh my goodness, I never realized. And now they're going to look at sound in so many different ways. And so like for my students, they go into a, an urban school to teach. And so they were asking questions last week about sound. And then they were saying things like, um, well, what do you hear? Is that a soft sound or is that a loud sound? And then they graph it. They graph the sounds and they, but they have to talk about how do you graph that? So anyway, and here, here's actually one of the misconception interviews. And you can see that the children have drawn there on the ground um, right in here. You can see where they, they were drawing and thinking about what it is that the questions that the students were asking around their particular standards. So anyway, so here's another sense making. How does air make things, um, how does air make things move? And so, but putting the load on the students helps the students feel like they have agency. They have the ability to truly understand science and be a part of it. And then here, um, so you could do looking at how leaves travel. Do they, 
for for different pushes and pulls. And so does they tremble? Do they swirl? Do they glide and have the kids act it out? But when you get up to second grade and you're talking about how events happen slowly or quickly, well, now we're we're looking at how to blow it through the straw and and blow a pom-pom, blow a, a nut, blow a rock, what moves, what doesn't. And now we're going to graph that. So you you're working with that concept at different levels, put thinking through. And it's exciting because you're thinking, what's going to be my phenomena? So we did absorbency. Well, what could we do for a phenomena? So we said, well, what if we did like a spilled milk, a spilled bowl of cereal? Ah, well, what would be the best thing to wipe that up? What would you wipe it up with? And you ask the kids. So their ideas come out. They write down questions. And so then you do an investigation with all different kinds of materials. And then at the end, you say, which one of these materials would be the best to wipe up that milk? And then you look at it with a microscope and why is this one the best? What is it about this material that makes it the best to pick up that milk? So it goes full circle. The phenomena comes back at the end. And how are we going to solve it or think about it? And so here I have, and I don't think I can, I have to pop out to hit this. Here are examples of storylines like that for elementary. So how does light help me see things and communicate with others? So there are complete lesson plans that help you think through, working through that idea. Or why is our corn changing? They had the the corn from Halloween and it sat in water and all of a sudden things started growing out of it. And they said, wait, why is it changing? And it was a whole life science. And why are different plants growing in different places? Why do some things wash up on the beach and not others? Where does our clean water come from and where does it go after we get it dirty? There's Cindy stuff, right? And why do dead things disappear over time? And then we have all kinds of health units. And then if I get back to my, get down here so I can see where I'm at. So that's elementary, but what about, what about middle and high school? And we're getting ready to have these free units at the elementary level. But if you look, what it says is, look at how many people are using this. It's zero dollars. The federal government has really worked hard to make this open for everyone so that everyone has access to this. So then we have, um, it helps children to have access to it. So if we look at the middle school units, and I'll just look at a few here, because it's really amazing what they're doing with the middle school. So we have like light. Why do we sometimes see different things when looking at the same object? Or why do natural hazards happen and how do we prepare for them? And so, um, and how do living things heal? Let's look at eighth grade. Um, what? Why do sometimes why do things sometimes get damaged when they hit each other? Or how can sound make something move? There's that sound that came back at eighth grade. Now it was at kindergarten, fourth grade. Now it's at eighth grade. When how can a magnet move another object without touching it? So all of these questions. And so if we just go, if I go back here, my I keep fighting with the zoom. I'm sorry, guys. And if I go back, and I'm almost how much time do I have? Actually, I'm sorry. Let me. Are you guys running low on time, hon? Uh, maybe just one or two minutes. And then okay, Dr. Piazzi joined us. We have one more presenter actually after you. Oh, okay. So then you can see here, here's like biology. Um, how do ecosystems work and how can we understand them to help us protect? And then um, physics, just to see um, how do, um, why do stars shine and will they shine forever? So then I have one more little thing. So what kinds of things are in our field? In science education and STEM education, the sky is the limit. But um, what I have here is different paths. You can do public or private schools. You can do informal settings like museums, discovery centers, aquariums, zoos, um, science centers. So like you you could work at the Science Bono Discovery Center in Johannesburg, the Cape Town Science Center, and National Historic Sites. You guys have all kinds of historical sites and, and natural history. And so there are a lot of things that you could do in that field of creating educational materials and training kids as they come to do these informal settings. So there's so much you can do to really help all ch children feel like they have the ability to do science and, and STEM. So anyway, if, if you have any questions, maybe save them till the end or put them in the chat and then we can listen to the last speaker. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Yeah, so